Welcome back to another episode of Creepy and Haunted Places. In this episode, we take a look at five locations, some of them known, some of them not known unless you're a local, and some of them you couldn't pay me to spend the night in, not even for a million dollars. Built in 1990, the Gorea Am or Chicken Church, is one of the structures that has an interesting, although highly questioned, backstory. In 1990, 67-year-old Daniel, who was working in Jakarta, claimed he had a vision from God who told him to build a house of prayer on top of a hill. A year after this, local landowners offered him the land for a reasonable fee. He claims he built the place, not as a church, but as a place for all those who believe in God. Later confirmed by Daniel, he also stated that it was to be a rehabilitation center for all kinds of ailments, including disabled children and drug addicts. Construction ceased in 2000 when the cost became too much to cover. One of the men who helped build the church now runs it as a museum. The building houses 15 rooms, three bathrooms, and one room in the basement, and an upstairs room known as the church hall. Visitors are asked to take caution, as all but three of the supporting pillars are starting to deteriorate. No evidence of paranormal activity has been captured, but it has become a hot spot for vandals, as well as people who see the place as a fitting spot to commit immoral acts. Mineral Wells, Texas has some fascinating history, with abandoned buildings, haunted hotels, and even the famous Crazy Water, as featured on an episode of Ghost Adventures. We take a look at a local hotel that a friend of mine piqued my interest in when she took a picture off her front porch showing the top floors of the hotel sitting above the trees and houses. The history is that of any other hotel, but stories abound of ghostly activity and unfortunate accidents. The Baker was established in 1922 when the citizens were concerned that non-citizens were profiting off the fame of their mineral water. The townspeople raised $150,000 to build a large hotel. The architecture was based off the Arlington Hotel in Hot Springs, Arkansas, known for its water and baths. Construction commenced in 1926, but was stopped when the owner, Theodore Baker, made a trip to California, where he visited a hotel with a swimming pool and told the architect that the hotel must have a pool out front. The Olympic-sized pool became the first to be built at a hotel in Texas. It's, the hotel soon featured 14 stories, 450 guest rooms, two ballrooms, and an in-house beauty shop. It also had a bowling alley, a gymnasium, and an outdoor pool. It took three years to complete, and the cost totaled out at $1.2 million. It opened on November 9, 1929. It became fully air-conditioned by 1940, adding to its appeal. Control was passed in 1934 to Earl Baker, Theodore's nephew, when he declared bankruptcy. The hotel became known as a health spa and saw immense business even after the stock market crash in the 1930s. But a decade later, its reputation went into decline after the discovery of antibiotics such as penicillin. It became popular once again during World War II, when Fort Walter's military base opened nearby and the population of mineral wells hovered close to 30,000. After the war ended in 1945, it saw only small events, eventually closing in 1963 on April 30th. A second attempt to open came in 1965, but was marred when Earl Baker was found unconscious in the Baker Suite, later dying as a result of a heart attack. It shut down again in 1972. There are currently renovation plans, and because of this, the Baker is under heavy watch by security and police officers. History tells of many deaths that had happened on the property, which draw thrill-seekers every year. A notable story involves a woman who is said to jump from the 13th floor in an attempt to hit the pool below, but instead landed on the bridge that crossed it. There's also a story that revolves around a young woman but it is unclear if she fell from the building or died within. A local mortician's daughter had checked into the hotel under a false name. 
She had been involved in a scandalous affair and took poison to end her life. Another story circulating is that of a young bellhop who had been crushed by an elevator. Then no one knows for sure if he was crushed above or below, or if the stories are true that he was cut in half. A picture sent to me by my friend shows what looks like a figure at the back of the room, but it is unclear if it's a trick of light or an object. Even after dark, the building looms over the city, decaying, creepy, in a place where stories of hauntings abound given by locals and enthusiasts alike. Though this place isn't classified as haunted, the scene itself as well as the decay of the rides offer trespassers goosebumps and a trip into its sketchy past, but no hint into its future. Covering 29.5 acres, the park was originally opened in 1969 under the name of Culture Park Planterwald. It ran until 1989 when the fall of the Berlin Wall marked its end with the GDR no longer around for funding. In 1991, the park was sold to Norbert White, but because of his checkered past, the deed was made out to his wife Pia. A former carnival operator, he'd been responsible for the deaths of seven people when he'd crashed a crane into a carousel while attempting to repair a roller coaster in Hamburg in 1981, also injuring 15 people in what was known as Germany's worst carnival disaster. In 1992, they reopened the park under the name of Spree Park and took extra time in bringing it up to European standards, investing 40 million Deutschmarks by 1997. Several new attractions were added, including a Wild West town complete with stuntmen. Even with 1.5 million visitors during the year, by 1993, the numbers became few, with only about 400,000 in 2001, leading to its closure on November 4th of that year. Shady deals and a later declaration that the site was a nature preservation also led to its closure, along with a debt of 11 million euros. White and family traveled to Peru, along with six of the attractions, hoping to build a new park in Lima, but after a failed attempt, he was sentenced to seven years in jail for attempting to smuggle cocaine from Peru to Germany. The park has remained closed since 2002. In 2011, a scene from, for the movie Hannah was filmed at the park, along with a music video for a German band. Guided tours were often given. The city of Berlin purchased the park in March 2014, but ceased with guided tours. In August of that same year, many portions of the park were destroyed in a fire that appeared to have been deliberately set. One of the most famous of the five bridges, South Bridge was built in the 18th century to link the Old Town's High Street with the university buildings. It was first proposed in 1775, but didn't begin until August of 1785. It consisted of 19 arch viaducts, with one visible and the remaining 18 hidden behind other buildings. The hidden arches were given extra floors to allow for industrial use. In total, 120 rooms, also known as vaults, were built beneath the surface, and it officially opened on March 1, 1788. The vaults were used as storage for workshops, but because they were never sealed against water, the vaults began to flood, leading to the first abandonment in 1795, being taken over once the previous user had vacated. With the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, the South Bridge area became a slum, quickly turning into a red light district, with brothels and pubs taking up residence within, and the vaults serving as shelter for the poor. With no windows to allow sunlight and having no fresh running water, crimes including robbery and murder became common, and criminals cashed in. The infamous serial killers Burke and Hare sold the corpses of their victims in the vaults to medical schools. The vaults were finally closed down and sealed between 1835 and 1875, with rubble being dumped inside to make them inaccessible. They were rediscovered in the 1980s by an ex-rugby -rug player, Nori Rowan, who used the tunnels to help a fellow rugby player escape Romanian police 
and seek asylum in 1989. They were excavated in the 1990s by Nori and his son. Today, the northern vaults are used for ghost tours, while the south vaults, vaults host two venues that cater to weddings, live music, and nightclubs. Reports of ghostly activity have been investigated by many paranormal specialists, including ghost adventures, who claim to have encountered spirits within. However, in 2011, a professor at the University of Hertfordshire invited people to spend time in the vault and concluded that people who were told of the ghostly activity were found to have more unusual sensations than those who were told only the history, suggesting that the visitors helped create most of the hauntings. This place sparked my interest when it was featured in an episode of MTV Sphere, where they sent six people out to a haunted location and sent them out on dares for two nights in the hopes of winning a cash prize. Whether the hauntings that night were real or fake, this place has seen history at its beginning and its worst, playing host to a crucial battle in American history. Built in 1821 on Dolphin Island, it was named for Edmund Pendleton Gaines, a United States Army officer who served in the War of 1812, the Seminole Wars, and the Black Hawk War. The fort was known for its role in the Battle of Mobile Bay during the American Civil War, which took place on August 5, 1864. On that day, a Federal fleet led by Rear Admiral David G. Farragut, assisted by soldiers, attacked a Confederate fleet led by Admiral Franklin Buchanan, as well as three forts that guarded the entrance to Mobile Bay. After running through a minefield and getting beyond the range of the shore guns, they attacked the fleet until only the CSS Tennessee remained. Although an effort to retaliate was made, it was damaged beyond use and the fleet surrendered. The fort was later modernized for the Spanish-American War and remains one of the nation's best preserved Civil War masonry forts. The fort still houses the original Civil War cannons, five pre-Civil War brick buildings, an operational blacksmith shop, kitchens, and a museum that details its history, as well as playing host to reenactment events. Visitors and employees have reported seeing apparitions of both Confederate and Union soldiers wandering the grounds, some even captured on film. Another apparition, said to be that of a soldier, is rumored to follow people around until they leave the front gates. Cold spots and footsteps are also common occurrences. MTV reported that during storms, bones washed up on shore, and the bones of Native American slaves were found in a collapsed tunnel, though no direct evidence has been given to support these claims. That's all the time we have left for this episode of Creepy and Haunted Places. Check back soon for the next installment. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. And the next time you get the urge to set foot in a creepier haunted place, don't forget to bring a candle. <laughs>